Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Charts with Dan, and it is a very special edition. There were not any big movies that came out in theaters this past weekend, but we are celebrating the one-year anniversary of this YouTube channel. I started it one year ago, actually tomorrow, on April the 20th, 2020. We were in the beginning stages of a global pandemic, and it turns out a year later, we're still here. Literally, the channel's still here, and the world is still here. It seemed like maybe it was a little touch and go for a while there, but uh, it's weird how things line up. We're here talking about it. It's been a year since I started the channel. I got my second shot today, so we're at this weird turning point uh, in a lot of different areas, but we're going to talk about the weekend box office as we always do, and then last week I asked all of you if there were some things you wanted me to chart to talk about for the one-year anniversary of the channel. A lot of people said, we want to hear about videos that did well, videos that didn't do as well on the channel, so I've got to look at that for you as well. And at the end of the show, I also have an announcement of some exciting new stuff that's coming up on this channel, so stay tuned. But let's start the show off like we always do with a look at the weekend box office. And as has been the case for the last several weeks, this is really no surprise here, Godzilla vs. Kong was on top of the box office in its third week with $7.7 million. It continues to decline the way that we would see a major blockbuster decline in the normal times. It was off a little over 40% this past weekend. And this could be the first kind of semblance of not bad news, but you would hope that maybe, and, and, and we'll see how it, it holds up against Mortal Kombat this weekend, but you would hope that maybe those drop-offs would start getting a little smaller because uh, most or all of the other films, except for Voice which came out last week and didn't make a whole lot of money to begin with, held pretty strong. In fact, when you look at Nobody, which is a great case, it was available on premium video on demand this week. Remember, we talked about this film and I said that because it is a universal film, it's subject to this deal that they worked out last year where after 17 days, they can make the movies that they put out available for premium video on demand. Nobody was part of that deal. And so they just put it out available for people to watch at home. And yet it's still at number two. Not only is it at number two, it fell off less than 10% from last weekend. When we look at those numbers, what do those numbers tell us? I think one thing that it does tell us is that the home market is not a silver bullet to kill the theatrical business model because there were obviously a lot of people who could have watched Nobody at home this weekend, and yet a substantial number of people, about the same number of people that chose to go see the film last weekend when you couldn't watch it at home, went to go see it this past weekend as well. So nobody continues to hold very well in the theatrical marketplace. Looking at the rest of the top five, The Unholy is at week three, Raya and the Last Dragon in week seven stays at number four. And really the only change in the top five is Tom and Jerry, which has come back into the top five after falling out. Voyagers really did not uh, start well or do a good second second weekend either because it's out of the top five but Tom and Jerry is another movie that's available in some markets on premium video on demand and yet some people choosing to watch it there it's weird Tom and Jerry is kind of in its third simultaneous window first it was available at the same time on HBO Max and in theaters and then for a little while just in theaters and now available premium video on demand and in theaters we are in some weird wacky times uh, but the top five looking pretty much the same the big holds for uh, most of these movies and nobody in particular would be the big Big story from this past weekend. Let's see what the 2021 domestic picture looks like. No change really except for at the very bottom of the chart. Godzilla vs. Kong remains number one with $80.6 million. We will see if it can steam towards $100 million. Um, the movie is already, according to most reports, going to be profitable. That would just kind of be a symbolic victory to get a movie over $100 million during these times. Tom and Jerry at number two, followed by Raya and the Last Dragon. Nobody at four. The Marksman at number five. Five, the Little Things, Chaos Walking, and The Unholy stay at 6, 7, and 8. And then there was a change at the bottom of this chart. As you can see, the Benedict Cumberbatch film, The Courier, has jumped over Judas and the Black Messiah, which is now the number 10 movie of the year. And unless something goes heinously wrong, I think that we're going to see Judas and the Black Messiah exit the chart this upcoming week because we have Mortal Kombat hitting theaters and HBO Max simultaneously. This was a delayed release. It was supposed to have come out this past Friday. HBO Max pushed it to this upcoming Friday. So we will see uh, another test model here. But again, a movie that is not available exclusively 
theatrically because Mortal Kombat will be on HBO Max. We're, it's like we just keep dipping our toes in the water. We're going to have to jump all the way in at some point. But Mortal Kombat is going to be another test case, a big franchise, something that particularly people of my age uh, really like and connect to, although I know Mortal Kombat has gone on beyond the generations. We'll talk about Mortal Kombat again, actually, later on in the show. But it's a rated R action film. We'll see what that kind of market looks like. Uh, Some very interesting numbers to look at coming up here in this next weekend. Let's look at the 2021 chart worldwide. And again, not a whole lot of change here. We have High Mom, Detective Chinatown 3, Godzilla vs. Kong, which is getting closer to that $400 million mark, A Writer's Odyssey, and Endgame. Those are your top five. Nothing changes there. At number six, however, there was a movie that entered the chart last week, has now jumped up three spots, and that is a Chinese film called Sister that breaks the $100 million mark. Tom and Jerry has surged ahead of Raya and the Last Dragon. Last week, these were flip-flopped. This could be due to some reporting delays. I'm not really sure why exactly uh, it has jumped ahead and surged ahead uh, just over the past week. So it's very possible these two may flip-flop again next week. It just depends on when the data and the numbers come come in. Boonie Bears, The Wildlife drops down one spot to number nine, and New Gods, Nature Reborn is at number 10. There is another film, though, that was actually the number one movie worldwide this past weekend. It was not Godzilla vs. Kong, and we have anime has just been on a hot streak, and it's yet another film in an anime series, Detective Conan, The Scarlet Bullet, which is part of an ongoing series. It's known as Case Closed in some parts here in the U.S., was the number one movie worldwide. It was fueled by grosses in China and Japan, and after uh, Evangelion, which we were just talking about, was on the chart a couple weeks ago, Demon Slayer, the the, the, the Demon Slayer movie that d- did huge grosses uh, last year going into this year, we are seeing a, a global market for anime. Of course, it's always existed, but a theatrical market still growing for anime films. So Detective Conan, The Scarlet Bullet, very likely that you may see that on that top 10 chart because it had a great opening weekend worldwide. One news story that you may have seen, particularly if you follow people that live in Los Angeles on social media, is something that broke right after my charts episode last week went live, or else I would have included it in my coverage then. The closure of not a major theater chain nationally, but one that was vital to the heart of cinema in Los Angeles, and that is the announcement of the closure of the Arclight Cinemas chain along with Pacific Theaters. This chain covered a lot of the major metropolitan area of Los Angeles because not only did you have uh, that theater, but they ran the Cinerama Dome, which is a landmark theater in Los Angeles. You've seen it in movies, you've seen it in TV shows. It is literally a a historical landmark, and that also right now is affected by this closure. Pacific Theaters also announced they were closing because they were owned by the same company, and though that's another big swath of screens in Los Angeles. They're located in huge shopping centers like the Grove, the Americana. Um, So many big hubs of movie going now, supposedly closed permanently given the capacity limits and the debt that they've just brought on during this pandemic their company decided that they just could not reopen there was no path to reopening and so you now have a huge amount of theaters vacant in Los Angeles and it's really hard to underscore and like I said if you followed people on social media living in Los Angeles and they're still talking about this you might say like what's the big deal it really is hard to understate Uh, just how much of the heartbeat of the film-going scene uh, the Arclight Cinemas were in particular in Los Angeles. The Dome would sometimes dress itself up out. This is something they did for Godzilla, King of the Monsters. You had Godzilla coming up out of the Dome. Um, I I have so many different movies that I saw at Arclight Cinemas or at the Cinerama Dome. Mad Max Fury Road, uh, The Dark Knight, Iron Man, either in Hollywood or in Sherman Oaks in the San Fernando Valley where I used to live. There Will Be Blood was a movie that I remember seeing. So many different films that are part of my DNA now that I saw at this theater chain. Uh, And and even just special events. This is a picture from uh, a screening I went to that was the Cornetto trilogy uh, when The World's End was coming out. I went and watched Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and then The World's End for the first time. Edgar Wright was there. And then this is a picture from the opening out of the Star Wars The Force Awakens. I went there the night that the movie opened i'd seen it for review purposes but you know every screen was playing it it was a great crowd a great scene um all of these movie going memories so many people in los angeles had tied directly to these theaters and now the prospect is there that they may go dark forever in my opinion i think that somebody is going to come in 
and either buy the theaters or figure out a way to mitigate these rent, uh, back rent that the, the theaters owe to maybe try to get these things back open under current management. Uh, but if these are truly lost, or even if some of these are lost, then the movie going market in Los Angeles just became that much harder to navigate because there are chain theaters uh, like AMC, but they're not located everywhere. And there are only so many screens. And, and when you lose this many, you know, Arclight did play the big movies, but they also oftentimes were one of the only theaters that played the smaller movies. I saw movies like Wind River and Ingrid Goes West at the Arclight because that's the only place that they were playing. Uh, uh, Brigsby Bear was only playing at the Arclight. So it's not just the big ones, it's the small movies as well. I, and this is not an ego thing, but I got recognized more at the Arclight when we would go to see movies uh, only because the people that worked at Arclight generally tended to be people that weren't just, you know, working a nine to five, but were really into film and were the types of people that didn't just work at the theater, but would watch things like Screen Junkies or Collider, Schmoes No, all all of the different movie stuff and it was always fun to go there and they, they ch chat about movies and talk about favorite films and stuff it, it really is the loss of not just a theater uh, but a culture and so I, I'm very much hoping that there's some way to preserve that if not at least for those that are living in Los Angeles this may be the biggest loss as far as the movie industry goes and the business goes of this pandemic because uh, the environment particularly at theaters like the Arclight is something that you just can't replace. Moving on to something kind of happier, as I mentioned, we are celebrating tomorrow the one-year anniversary of the launch of this channel, and last week I solicited some suggestions for different charts that you might want to see, and a lot of people just wanted me to talk about what the last year has been like for the channel, some videos that have done well, some videos that maybe haven't done so well. So let's get into that. First of all, let's look at, and this is something that I've been doing for the last several weeks, but a chart just of the last 365 days of movie going. So these are movies that all came out within the last year, this crazy, crazy year. Um, Godzilla vs. Kong remains at the top of this list, followed by Tenet at number two, The Croods, A New Age at number three, Wonder Woman 1984 at four, Tom and Jerry at number five, Raya and the Last Dragon at six, The New Mutants at seven, The War with Grandpa at number eight, Unhinged is at number nine right now, but I would wager that by next week, nobody may have overtaken it to become the ninth highest grossing film of the last 365 days. So these are the top 10 movies of the last year, basically since we launched this channel. And it is crazy to think about, you know, not just how different all these movies are, but the different times in which they came out. The fact that Tenet is there at number two, $57.9 million, which in a vacuum looks terrible. But when we all go back to last summer and how few theaters were open and just the rollout and, and, and everything like that, you know, the new mutants, all of the buildup, and then just kind of the, the air slowly coming out of the balloon of that movie. Um, while these are all films that came out kind of partially in theaters, uh, they are also kind of all have their own story and their own special circumstances, whether it's the longevity of The Croods A New Age or Wonder Woman 1984 being available on HBO Max, Unhinged being the first movie to hit the theaters in a wide release uh, after all of the theaters closed. Um, you know, War with Grandpa, another movie that was just around forever. It, it does feel like these are, movies are a little bit different because there's a story that goes with each and every one of those that ties directly to the uniqueness of these times. And this has been a very unique time because we're coming up on a year since I launched this channel. Um, apart from Screen Junkies, it's been a little bit over a year since I left there. Um, kind of, it would always be kind of launching into the great unknown, but especially with everything that was going on at the time. Honestly, even though we were already sort of at the beginning of this when I launched the channel, if you told me that this would have been the last year of my life and all of the twists and turns. I mean, I'm sitting here in a different state, uh, in, in a house. Um, never would have predicted that a, a year ago. Just so many things that have changed radically over the last year. And yet I think the thing that a lot of people are looking forward to the most is getting back to some sense of normalcy. But let's take a look back at this very unique year. And one thing that a lot of you wanted to hear first and foremost was what are the top five videos uh, that people have watched? And let's look at that as far as views go. Um, the number one video actually uh, for my first year is why I love RoboCop. And that may seem like a, a kind of a random video to be my most watched video. I told you that I was going to mention Mortal Kombat. I just so happened and I had no idea this was going to happen because I'm not a huge gamer. I was never really that big into Mortal Kombat. 
But it just so happened that right around the time that I launched the Why I Love Robocop video, they introduced Robocop as a playable character in Mortal Kombat. And so searches on Robocop skyrocketed and it took this video up to the very top of my most watched videos over the last year. Second on that list is the launch video, the, the very first video I released um, as, you know, under the name Dan Merle Movies on this channel. Number three is my non-spoiler review of Zack Snyder's Justice League, the Snyder Cut, and that was has been a big view getter for the channel. Um, it, it's My review is there at number three, and then at number four, the day that it was announced right behind, it was what I got wrong about the Snyder Cut, my video basically where I said like, hey, listen, I said this thing was never gonna come out, that they would never put the money into finishing it. Yeah, I was completely wrong about that. That kind of set the tone and the tenor for this channel very early on, and it, it wasn't something that I anticipated, but I think it was an opportunity for me to kind of get across my general philosophy, which is, you know, I, I, I'm i gonna try to kind of call them as I see them, and uh, if I get something right, I'll mention it. If I get something wrong, I'll talk about it, because I was really surprised by Zack Snyder's Justice League, but I'm not gonna lie that that movie uh, really has helped to float uh, the channel for the first year because there's been so much interest around it and I'm glad that I had the freedom and the opportunity to look at it from different angles and talk about it as much as I have and then at number five was an episode of this show actually that came out right at the beginning of this year where we talked about the reviews for Wonder Woman 1984 and why they dropped so quickly and again I'm very happy that this video is in the top five because those are the kind of videos that I love to make these kind of analytical deep dives talking about dates and different times and embargo dates and the fact that that was a very unprecedented drop for that film and why that might have been. Um, I think when you look at a lot of these top five videos, I'm glad that they're my most watched ones because I think a lot of them have a lot to do with my whole philosophy on things. Uh, but something else, and this is just for fun, uh, because honestly, the view counts on these videos, uh, I, I'm still uh, not ashamed of. There's a lot of people that would like this number of views on their videos, but some people ask, like, what were the ones that you, people weren't interested in? And I didn't include anything that was less than a month old, because I, I just launched all my movies here on the channel, and some of those episodes are gaining views, etc. So these are videos that are all a month or older. Uh, the least interesting one to people, but it was the most fun for me because Mara and I got to go take a field trip. It was one of our first times like out, like out, out during the pandemic. We went to the drive-in and reviewed the movies Relic and The Lodge. And uh, even though that was our least viewed video uh, thus far, I still think it was a lot of fun. It was a fun field trip and, and, and we had a great time just getting out of the house. Uh, number two is the commentary track for Independence Day that I put out last year. That's probably not a shocker. I, I didn't expect huge traffic on that. And then three, four, and five, it really is, this is just such a paradox because these Netflix movies are available to more people than ever. And yet my third, fourth, and fifth lowest watched videos were all about Netflix films. Christmas Chronicles 2, Hubie Halloween, and then a combo review of Mank and the Prom. Uh, and these were not obscure movies, but if people for whatever reason just weren't especially interested in seeing uh, my thoughts compared to some of the other videos that I've done on these Netflix films. But there's also another metric. It's not just raw views, but also watch time. These were my top five videos of this past year when you look at watch time. And number one was still my Zack Snyder Justice League review, but not the non-spoiler review. It was actually the spoiler review. And that just goes to show you how views don't always tell the difference because it's not one of my top five most watched videos, but it is by a huge margin my longest watched video. It was a pretty extensive spoiler review, so that's not surprising. My second uh, most watched video by watch time is my movie collection where I go through all my Blu-rays, etc. Uh, number three is why I love Ro RoboCop, which was my number one overall most watched video. At number four, Wonder Woman 1984 reviews, which was my fifth most watched videos as far as views go, but my fourth most as far as watch time. And then at number five, and this isn't shocking because it was pretty long, uh, the first week that I was running the channel, uh, along with Mara, who is an amazing support system for me and, and helps so much behind the scenes, uh, we did a an Ask Merle Anything, an AMA. And talking about the live AMA that we did in the first week kind of brings me around to one of the things I wanted to talk about about the future. We're entering year two as of tomorrow. Uh, and to me, this is kind of phase two. And I've been talking about phase two of the channel for a long time. And that's because I keep adding things like the podcast and trying to figure out my workflow. But there's one thing that I've wanted to do from the very beginning that we've kept kind of kicking down the road because of the move and everything else. And that is a live show, not just live to talk about trailers and talk about movie news, etc., but also to answer your questions weekly we will be launching our live show next week uh, at our at its regular time. We're going to start it out next Thursday. 
at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to try out that time slot, see if it works for everybody. We may move around. We're trying not to conflict with too many other things. We know that everybody's got their own stuff that they watch. But it's going to be, at least to start, a weekly live show where I can do things beyond just the box office stuff uh, and movie reviews. I can talk about movie news, talk about trailers, and talk about the stuff that you want to talk about. We'll be taking your questions, uh, all of that stuff. I'm excited to be more interactive and to go live, to be able to cover more things to be able to bring in some special guests to talk about stuff. So stay tuned next week for it to debut in its regular slot next Thursday. However, we are going to do a special edition live show right after the Academy Awards this Sunday. So it'll be a recap and a review of the show. I may even have a special guest or two to bring in where we talk about what happened, talk about the winners, etc. Stay tuned this Sunday after the Academy Awards for our first live show. And then next Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 Eastern for the debut of our weekly live show. It, it's going to be a growing process. It's gonna We're going to learn as we go and probably make a few mistakes, but I'm excited to add this new dimension to the channel as we keep growing into our second year. Now that we looked forward, why don't we look back and we will look at this week's box office flashback. And this week, we're just going to cover one box office week. There weren't a whole lot of other notable moments, but I wanted to go back to this past weekend, the 16th weekend of the year, 2004, and that saw the debut of what some would call a new film by Quentin Tarantino. I think he has retroactively defined this as the second half of one movie, but Kill Bill Volume 2 debuted to $25.6 million this week, 17 years ago. The Punisher, pre-MCU, also debuted the same week uh, with $14 million. In third place was the second weekend of Johnson Family Vacation, starring Cedric the Entertainer. Then in fourth place, week three of Guillermo del Toro's first Hellboy movie with $5.6 billion, and then week three of one of the most forgettable Disney films of all time, Home on the Range, with $5.5 million. So a pretty close competition there between three, four, and five, and then a pretty big gulf between one and two. As always, we're going to wrap up the show by looking at the streaming charts, what people are watching, buying, and renting at home. And let's start with Amazon. And at number one, I mentioned that nobody had a great hold at the box office, less than 10% drop off. There were people at home that were also choosing to watch the film because it was number one on the Amazon charts, the premium video on demand, followed by another film that's currently in theaters, The Courier at number two. Tom and Jerry, premium video on demand, is at number three. That's its third window since the movie opened. Chaos Walking and Raya and the Last Dragon are still on the chart from last week. Then Promising Young Woman, the rental uh, for that film, a big contender coming up to the Oscars this Sunday. The Father, another big contender, the premium video on demand at number seven. Greenland is back on the chart at number eight. People renting that movie. The Crude's A New Age at number nine and Judas and the Black Messiah at number 10. Let's look at what people are watching on iTunes and at number one, also on iTunes is Nobody. So Nobody was bringing in some money, not just at the box office, but on several different platforms. Promising Young Woman is at number two. The Courier debuts at number three, followed by News of the World and City of Lies. Wonder Woman 1984 is at number six with the buy rent window open. At number seven is Breach, which is not the spy drama that came out in the early 2000s, but a Bruce Willis movie that came out last year. That is probably on the chart because it was open for 99 cent rental this past week. Then at number eight, Tron Legacy. Again, perhaps on the chart because it was available to buy for $5 this past week. And at number nine, Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. The buy rent window now open on that. And Raya and the Last Dragon, still available only for purchase for $30, but at number 10 on the iTunes charts. And finally, let's see what people are watching on Netflix. And we'll look overall at the streaming service in general first. And at number one is Synchronic, which I really need to see because I got some really reliable recommendations on this film. I've heard that Anthony Mackie is great in it. Um, it was a film that came out last year. It was available for purchase and rent on the various different uh, platforms, but it's now available available for streaming on Netflix, and it jumps to number one. At number two is a, a Netflix series starring Jamie Foxx called Dad, Stop Embarrassing Me, which I haven't seen, but it sounds like a very sitcom -y type name. Thunder Force, the Netflix original movie, is at number three. Then at number four, a new Netflix movie, Why Did You Kill Me? Followed by The Baker and the Beauty, a series that is not a Netflix original series, but is on Netflix. 
The Circle, which is a Netflix reality series, is at number six, followed by Coco Melon, still on the chart, The Little Rascals, Who Killed Sarah, a Netflix original series, and then Nikki, Ricky, Dicky, and Dawn, another Nickelodeon series. Nickelodeon has found a lot of success putting their stuff on Netflix because we keep seeing these series pop up on the Netflix overall top 10. And finally, let's see what people are watching on the Netflix movie charts. Uh, Synchronic, Thunder Force, Why Did You Kill Me, and The Little Rascals are all on the overall top 10, so it's no surprise they're the top four. Barbie and Chelsea, The Lost Birthday, is at number five. Why not? At number six is a Netflix original film, followed by The Zookeeper's Wife, Guillermo del Toro's Crimson Peak, Saving Private Ryan at number nine, and Sniper, Ghost Shooter at number 10. And that pretty much wraps it up for charts today. Thank you so much for coming to talk about the box office and talk about the one year anniversary of the channel. And as if to help us celebrate, we're actually gonna have a packed week of stuff here. Not only charts today, but then later this week, I'm gonna have a video with my final Oscar picks. I did the one that said who I would have nominated and who I thought would be nominated. This week, I'm gonna pick who I think should win the Academy Awards this Sunday. Also, there will be a full season review of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. A lot of you have asked why I haven't been doing episode-by-episode episode reviews, and I, I thought that I might, but I, I really do think that it's it's not really a show that I had strong enough feelings after each individual episode, other than curiosity about what the next episode is going to be about, to talk about each and every week. I will be doing a full season wrap-up of the show, so stay tuned for that later this week. I will also be reviewing Mortal Kombat at some point. I'm not sure if I'm going to get an advanced screener or I may just watch it when it comes out on HBO Max, but there will be a review for Mortal Kombat on the channel later this week. There will also be another episode of All My Movies as we wrap up Best Picture Month, and then we're wrapping everything up with our live after show after the Academy Awards on Sunday. That will be leading into the debut of the live show in its regular slot next Thursday. So stay tuned. There's going to be a lot of updates and a lot of new things and a very busy week here on the channel. Thank you so much for your support over the last year and for watching. I really am hoping that year two is going to be a year of a lot of fun, a lot of growth, probably a lot of experimentation as we try different things, and also going back to the basics, more movies coming out, more reviews coming out. I am excited about the future of this channel, and I appreciate everybody who's helped build it so far. Thank you for watching. Be safe out there, and I'll see you next time.